HR issues can kill you. One complaint against your company can turn your world upside down. And you spend way too much time dealing with HR when you should be spending your time on making a profit. You should talk to Bambi. With Bambi, get access to your own dedicated U.S.-based HR manager starting at just $99 per month. They get to know you and your business while providing HR expertise and the personal touch you need and want. They're available by phone, email, and real-time chat, so onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance, and your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, you'll automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. HR managers can easily cost 80 grand a year, but Bambi starts at $99 per month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Accelerate under podcast when you sign up. It'll really help the show. Spelled BAM, B-E-E dot com. Bambi.com. Type in Accelerate. Me, 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 but also you. The Pharaoh fast forwards his favorite foreign film. Powder donut. <clears throat> Okay, what's my line? Uh, the only line I see here on the script is get options based on your budget with the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. Oh man, that's a tongue twister, huh? I'm sorry, I'm gonna need a few more minutes. <clears throat> bulbous Walrus, the Bulbous Walrus. The Name Your Price tool, only from Progressive. The owl ran afoul of the comatose Coxswain. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. Welcome to Accelerate Your Business Growth with your host, Diane Helbig. Diane is a leading small business development and leadership coach, author, and speaker who is passionate about sharing valuable ideas, tips, and techniques with business professionals worldwide. Diane brings you the world's experts and gurus in all things business, whether it's sales, structure, social media, planning, or plateauing, guests bring their expertise and energy to each episode. When growing your business is your focus, Accelerate Your Business Growth is the show to listen to. Got a topic or guest suggestion? Let Diane know. The goal is to make sure you have the information you need to move your business forward. Thanks for joining us. Settle in and enjoy. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. Today's podcast is sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken audio entertainment and information. Listen to audiobooks whenever and wherever you want. Get a free book when you sign up for a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash businessgrowth. Accelerate Your Business Growth podcast continues to gain recognition as a great resource for uh, business, sales, entrepreneurship, uh, you name it, and uh, that is really because of the guests. Uh, These are folks who have expertise in particular areas of business, and they join me to have a conversation where they share that expertise with all of you. That way you can get what you need and implement it in your business so that you can realize greater success. Today is no different. My guest today is Wally Gustafson. Wally is a small business owner with 19 years of entrepreneurial experience. He had investors in a startup company that eventually failed. He then created, without investors, a basement business that turned into a multi-million dollar online retail business. He's seen a 10-year trend of 25% year-over-year growth be followed by four years of 30% decline. Wally has learned more about business through his failures than his success. Thanks so much for joining me today, Wally. Hey, Diane, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be on the show, and I'm excited to talk to you today. Excellent. Well, I am as well. Now, um, I want to dive right into, um, uh, for people who are launching either a, a product or a business, and I'm wondering if you would share with the listeners your number one rule 
that you think people should follow when it comes to actually launching new business, new product? Sure, absolutely. So for me, my my number one rule, my litmus test is worst case scenario is always zero. So I sell products. So through the years, I've had a lot of people come to me uh, that are thinking of starting to sell a product and they'll say, hey, this is what I'm thinking. I'm going to do this. Here's my price. And worst case scenario, I'll just mark it down to the cost. I'll liquidate it and I'm not really out of anything. Or I'll sell it slightly below the cost of the item and then I'll just lose a little bit of money. And I would argue that those aren't really even close to worst case scenario. So what I mean by worst case scenario is always zero, is that you've got to be willing to put the time, energy, resources, everything into a product or service and generate absolutely zero sales. And that's the litmus test that I use. So I ask myself, am I willing to invest time and resources into this product and lose every dollar and minute I put into it? And if the answer is yes, then I proceed. And I'll tell you, there's a couple of important distinctions I want to make there, Diane. It's that I don't want people to hear me saying that, um, go into it thinking you're not. No, I, yeah. that's not what I'm saying. I don't go into anything thinking this isn't going to work. I've just recognized that it's a possibility. I think it's important for people to remember that. The second thing is, it can sound a little negative. So when you say worst case scenario zero, I can understand how that could maybe scare someone and say, well, maybe I don't want to try this. How about this? Just say it this way. What's the worst thing that could happen? And so I use this lesson with my kids all the time. I think it's super practical where I'll just say, what's the worst thing that could happen? Worst case scenario is always zero. I think it applies in business and in life. And I found it to be very helpful in a way for me to feel comfortable going into any new venture. Got it. I think that's a great, <clears throat> excuse me, philosophy to have. Um, and, and, it, and I like that it's a litmus test because it sort of gives you an idea of whether you should even venture forward, right? If, if you can't go there, then that tells you something about your belief system in, in the product or, or service or business. No, absolutely. And Diane, I, my guess is that you've heard lots of small business owners say worst case scenario before. I mean, it's a term we throw out a lot, and it's just something that I just constantly remind myself. Worst case scenario really is truly zero. All expense, all time, no revenue. Right. What I will, I'll throw one other thing in here. I will sure. tell you, though, that even when I've done something and it generates zero or next to zero in sales, I've always found it a super valuable experience. So I've either met people or I've learned a lesson that was totally unexpected. And I found it's just uh, that even though it may be zero financial return to me, that there's some other intangible asset that I gained from the experience. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I think that's great. That, that is key. And as long as you get something out of it, is it really zero, right? I mean, Correct. It's never really, yeah, yeah. So let's talk some about pricing. I think this is something that hangs a lot of people up. Um, how to price effectively. So, so what's your, you know, what's a good rule for figuring that out? Sure. Um, for me, I, the, the rule that I learned sort of the hard way was charge a price for your product or services that you can accept for the long term. Um, for three years, I taught a small business management class in the MBA program at Lindenwood University, which is based here in St. Louis, and so part of the class was that the students would come to me and they would say, um, I'm going to start this business, and in the beginning, I'm going to give the product away, or I'm going to really heavily discount it. And I was sort of able to warn them from my first startup how that might be a pitfall that they want to avoid and maybe ways to get around that. Uh, but when I started my first company, before I had angel investors, I went out and I had signed up the first 30 clients. So the business was um, – and inter this is a long time ago. I'm dating myself here, but this is back in 2000 before all businesses had their own platforms for re hiring and recruiting. And we were uh, a company that helped hourly job seekers find jobs. So we focused on high school and college age job seekers, and they could apply to fast food and uh, retail locations, any, any jobs like that. And I thought, I'm going to charge $5 a month per location. Because if I get everyone to sign up, my thought was, I win, because I have all the customers. 
Right. Well, then I brought in angel investors, and they're like, hey, we love everything, but $5 doesn't cut it. You've got to be at $50 a month. And what I learned was it was easier for me to walk into a customer who had never heard of our service and say it was $50 a month per location than it was for me to go back to a customer that paid $5 a month and say it's now $6 or it's now $10 because they saw that as a 20 to 100% increase and they were anchored on that lower price. And I think so many entrepreneurs, including myself, clearly, we fall into this situation where we're like, we so desperately want what we're doing to work that we undervalue or underprice what we're offering. And so I say, set a price for your products or services that you can live with for the long term and that makes financial sense for your company. And if you're going to increase prices, because from time to time that happens, make sure you, have a re you can justify those increases through enhancements or services, it, some sort of tweaking to what you're offering, rather than just saying, you know, it, cost of living has gone up, I have to my, pay my employees more. Well, right. the customer just, they don't care about that. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you've got, you've got it. They, they could recognize it to be a reality, but they don't, they, they, they don't want to pay more. So you have to be sort of able to justify why you'd be raising the price. Got it. Yeah, so, so don't start out behind, right, and then try and figure it out. Go for what the value statement really is and stand by it. Sure, and you know what I told um, my students was, if you really feel like you want to come in with a lower price, make it what you call an introductory price. Make sure that your clients understand, hey, this is for the first three months, you're getting it for 50% off. But after that, going forward, it goes back to regular price. And I said, you can do that, A, if you've set that expectation with the customer in advance and if you really believe in your product or service. So if they understand going in, this is a temporary number, I'm going to move to this if it works, and you have a great product or service, they'll end up paying it because you haven't anchored them on what they believed the price was going to be. Okay. You, so it's setting the expectation. Correct. If, if, if you're going to do something like that, I would tend to say just start with the price that you believe it should be. But I do know that some people are like, no, I just, I need a few customers. And sometimes when you're starting, those first few customers are so important because yeah. you can leverage their name to then land other customers, and I get that. Right. Okay. All right. So you say that false modesty is bad for business owners, and I'm wondering if you would expand on that. Yeah, and, and I would say that's probably one of the biggest challenges, um, it been one of the biggest challenges for me. And so I say be humble. Just be careful not to cross that line. And sometimes I have crossed that line. So be willing to explain what it is that you do. So instead of, if someone said, hey, Wally, what do you do? Up until, I mean, literally, Diane, maybe a year ago, people would say, what do you do? I wouldn't say, look, I run a small retail company. Um, I'm in charge of all apparel, product development. I work with overseas manufacturers. Going into some quick but detailed information, I would just say, hmm, I buy stuff and sell it online. That's it. Nothing special. We, and because I, I just was like, I don't want to make a big deal of this. What happens, though, if you start sort of presenting yourself that way to enough people, they start believing that you're not anything special. So down the road, you want to work with someone. You, have, you, you want to ask them for support. You want to sell them a product or service. You've sort of created that, how that, what their perception of, of you is going to be, even if that really isn't the perception. So I'd say in many times, false modesty is real. People feel confident in what it is that they do. They're just truly being modest. I'm saying avoid that situation where it's almost where you're turning, it becomes sort of an imposter syndrome where you're saying, even though I've had success, it really isn't like the success of other people. Be confident up to the level to where you've actually, to what your experience would dictate. Don't overstate it, but definitely don't understate it. Got it. That is great advice. All right, now I, I want to shift gears a little bit because mm -hmm. I am really curious about um, your beliefs around customer service. Okay. 
Sure. You know, we decided early on that we were going to treat customer service as a cost of doing business that we were going to avoid looking at the cost to fix a customer's problem relative to the order value. And instead, we were going to ask ourselves, what would I want done if I was this customer? And then just hope that we could accomplish that. And so here would be an example. A customer buys a shirt from us for $30, pay $5 for shipping, so they got $35. Our shipping partner would say the package was delivered on X day and left on the front porch, and they would call us and say, I don't have it. And we'd go through the standard, okay, did you check here? Did you check with your neighbor? They're like, look, I don't have it. And then they would compound the situation more by saying, that was a gift for my dad for his birthday, and his birthday is tomorrow at 5. We're going to his house tomorrow at 5, and I really need it by 10 a.m. tomorrow. So if we looked at it relative to the order value, We'd say, boy, we got the cost of the shirt, the cost of next day air to get it there by 10 a.m. tomorrow. That's going to cost us $70. We could just then say, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to issue you a refund. And I guess technically we're doing sort of the right thing because they're not out any money. But what I'd say is we haven't fixed their problem. So, yeah, they have their money, but they wanted that item. Now they still have to go scramble to find the product. So we've said, look, it's a cost of doing business. Don't look at the value of the order. Just fix it for the customer. And while today we manufacture most of what we sell, we still do have product that we'll buy from um, license holders here domestically in the U.S. And we have on occasion, customer says, it disappeared, I didn't get it. And we go, oh, my goodness, we're sold out. Like we don't have it. We've gone as far as to buy it from a competitor and ship it to that customer. Wow. Because we want customers that we're going to have for the long term. So the goal is, is for them, any, I'd say any reasonable, I would think that you would probably agree, any reasonable person would, would say, hey, mistakes happen. And they, boy, they went above and beyond to fix this for right. me. I'm going to go back to them. And hopefully the lifetime value of that customer exceeds whatever cost was involved in fixing the issue for them, whether or not that issue is your fault or not. Yeah. Wow. That's really great. I, I like that philosophy. Okay, I'm going to take a quick sponsor break, and then I have some more questions for you. Great. Accelerate Your Business Growth Podcast is happy to be sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken digital audio entertainment and information. They have over 150,000 titles to choose from, and you can listen to them on any device, including whatever you're hearing us on right now. And if you sign up at our link, which is audibletrial.com slash businessgrowth, you get one free audiobook and a one-month trial of the service. Some examples of books you can listen to on audible.com are Everyone Deserves a Great Manager by Scott Miller and The Ultimate Sale by Justin Goodbread. So visit audibletrial.com slash businessgrowth, explore the books that are of interest to you, and receive one free audiobook when you sign up for the trial. Today we're speaking with Wally Gustafson about just business basics and getting some really great um, insights from him. Wally, before we went on the sponsor break, we were talking about customer service and and you were providing your philosophy. And I wanted to mention that one of the things that I really like about that is it frees people up from having to think about what do I do, right? Mm -hmm. Like, how, how do I juggle this thing? How do I handle this situation? Because it, it's just you, you make it right, right? You fix it. You don't have to worry about figuring out the you know ROI or, or any of those things, and it puts the customer's problem front and center. Like, you know, you said um, we would have been, you know, help, we would have been telling them the truth, but we would have been helping them solve his problem. And right. So, that, yeah, and I mean, that's really significant that if you look at it in terms of we want to make sure that our customer doesn't have a problem, then it changes that thought process for everyone in the company. Right. And if you put yourself in their shoes, and I think we've all been in a situation before where we didn't get something we hoped we got or we were disappointed, say, how would I like this handled? Yeah. And then just go from there. Yeah. Yep, that makes all kinds of sense. 
Okay. Um, I want to talk about really understanding our clients. And if someone's listening and they're thinking um, that they're struggling with getting their client, you know, to answer their questions or commit to a project, what would you advise? Yeah, and so this is another thing that I've I, I, I've learned lots of lessons, and, and generally they've been hard ones to learn. But it's ask the difficult questions that need to be answered, no matter how painful it feels to answer the question, or how much we fear the answer. And I'm Diane. I, I I would say most people some at some point in time in our life we feared asking questions because we or fear we feared actually what was the the answer that was going to come back to us. Sure. Um, and so w- one of the startups that I've had through the years was a small media company, and we primarily created television and radio spots for small one- to two-location businesses in the St. Louis metro area. Um, but I did have one client that was a national client, and we had the fun of producing television spots that were on MTV and ESPN nationally, and it was a lot of fun. But ultimately, that contract was coming to an end, and we knew it was coming to an end. Um, But there were a lot of loose ends that sort of still needed to be tied up before the end of the month. And I wasn't sure if they wanted me to do it or if they were just going to handle it, given the fact that the contract was about ready to end. So I asked the client, do you want me to keep working on this for you? And they were like, yes, absolutely. So we did all the work, everything we needed to close out the account. End of the month, we send them an invoice. As always, they paid it quickly. And what we found, though, is for all the sort of hard expenses, hosting fees, any sort of stuff like that, they paid. Anything that was either for my time or someone who works for me time, they wrote discount taken and didn't pay us for that time. Wow. Then they stopped taking our calls. They wouldn't respond to emails. But, you know, Diane, the, the person who was really at fault was me because I asked them, do you want me to keep working on this for you? When really what I wanted to know was, are you going to pay me to keep working on this for you? <laughs> so my fear of maybe they aren't going to pay me. So I wasted a month. I could have invested that month's time with other clients, landing new jobs. Instead, we spent it there and we didn't have any money. And honestly, I also made it really easy on them because they could justify their action by saying, he only asked, do you want us to work on this? He didn't ask us if we were going to pay him. So I gave them an out, and I didn't ask the question that I wanted answered, and that was a big lesson for me. So as tough as it is, I would encourage everyone, just bear down, ask the question. Yeah, yeah, that is tricky. Well, I mean, you know, I, I, it, it is interesting that um, people don't want the answer, but what they don't realize is, they're going to get the answer one way or another. The question Absolutely. You know, is it going to be painful or, or is it going to be less painful? Really? It really would have been less painful if I just asked up yeah. front and found out that answer. I've been like, okay, great. Hey, it was awesome working with you. Best of luck. Yeah, right. Exactly. So it was right. double pain in my example. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly right. Okay, that is such a great story. Sorry that, that it happened, but, but it is a great story. It, it's okay. I'm here. My pain is for your uh, listeners uh, to not have to go through that. (laughs) Right, exactly. Right. Okay, so if someone is, um, you know, just starting out, Mm -hmm. and so, like, they don't have any clients, like, they get their first one, how do they make sure they really understand that client's needs? Because I think some people think, well, once I have clients, then I have an idea of what they need. I have an idea of what I'm doing for them. But if it's their first, are there particular questions you think they should be asking them? Or? Well, I think that what's most important is that there is complete clarity on what their client wants them to provide them. And so it goes, it really, uh, you know, you asking this question ties in really well to just sort of asking the, the painful or direct questions. Maybe these aren't painful, but it's sort of saying, I need specific questions answered. I need to ask them. Um, I, you, I've had a friend come to me before and say, you know what, I just got this client and it was a service related company and they keep using this word that I understand what the word means, but within the context of how they're using it, it doesn't make sense to me. 
And I'm like, but I don't want to come across as if I don't know what they're talking about. I, I'm scared to ask. I don't know what to do. And I was like, no, you have to ask them. You have to seek clarification. There's, there's, there's no shame in seeking it. And if you feel like, boy, I'm going to be embarrassed asking the question, just think of how you're going to feel if you come back and provide them not what they were wanting. Right. It's going to be way more embarrassing, and you're going to end up in a situation like I did where you've done work that pot- potentially won't get paid for, and you might lose the client completely. Yeah. So, you know, I, I've even had a friend say, I don't remember the person's name. <laughs> Boy, that's, that is tough. You know, they didn't get a business card. Is it? Now, I get that is hard, but you've got to find a way, may, you know, if it's not with them, just to ask for that information. Yeah. And, and if you have a second, I have an embarrassing story, but one that is a real world that would sort of help explain how if I had asked for clarification, um, it would have eliminated a lot of issues. Sure. And so this is a lifetime ago. This is 19 years ago, much younger in my life. And my wife and I were buying a house and it was in a subdivision where they were just building it. So you got the opportunity to pick a few things that you wanted. And we'd said, hey, boy, we'd love to have hardwood floors in the lower level. But you know what? The cost they're charging is pretty high. So I did the math. I was like, you know, it'll be cheaper if we just put in the construction grade carpet, move in, rip it out, buy wholesale hardwood and pay someone to put in it. It'll actually be cheaper. We'll save money doing that. So that's what we did. Moved in, ripped out the carpet. Someone to give, I bought the hardwood. Someone to give me the name of this guy. I called the guy. Didn't answer. I left him a voicemail. When he called me back, I didn't pick up the phone because I didn't recognize the number. And he left me a voicemail. And this guy had a super deep voice with one of the coolest but thickest southern accents I'd heard in a long time. And my mom grew up on a dairy farm in a town of 400 people in the hills of Virginia. So I've heard a lot of southern accents. (laughs) <laughs> and this guy's southern accent was super thick. But basically he said, you know, I can't do the job, but call this company. And he said to ask for Buzzard Joe. So that should have been a trigger for me. I should have thought, mm, Buzzard Joe does not sound like what I should be asking for. But what I allowed was, I don't know this guy. Do I really want to bother him with calling back and asking him? Is that really the name? And I also just said, boy, this sounds like a real manly man from the South. I bet she does have a friend named Buzzard Joe. So pick up the phone. I call the place. I said, "Um, so-and-so told me to call you. Here's what I'm looking for. And I was told to ask for Buzzard Joe. And it was like silence on the other end of the phone. And the guy finally replies, it's Buzz or Joe. (laughs) And... I was like, oh, my goodness. So now I have the embarrassment of saying Buzzard Joe when I could have eliminated this by just picking up the phone and saying, (laughs) I just want to confirm that that's who I'm supposed to be asking for. So while this isn't like like a business problem, it certainly sets the tone for me to say from now on, I'm asking when I don't know what the person said. Exactly. That's hysterical. (laughs) Okay. I want to sort of shift gears um, and ask for your input on why you think most small businesses never take that next jump in size, like to Mm -hmm. medium or medium to large or even straight to large. What do you think is going on there? So there could be a myriad of reasons for sure. Um, For some, it was never part of their plan. They, they wanted a small business, steady income, less work, less uncertainty. That's totally awesome. Unfortunately for many, it's because as entrepreneurs, we can't get out of the way. We're control freaks. So we started the company doing everything, and we can't relinquish the responsibility to others. And so we become bottlenecks when it comes to sort of getting things done. And I've always said, you know, be the heart of your company, breathe life into your company, but let others, when possible, become the arms and legs that sort of get the jobs done. Um, so I really think relinquishing control is a big challenge for business owners. And it's why it's, it's not a guarantee for success, but I will tell you that if you try to do everything yourself, 
it is almost a guarantee that you won't grow past a certain point because you just physically won't be able to get the job done. Yeah, right. Right. <clears throat> you only have so much bandwidth. Correct. But don't don't you think that or do you think I shouldn't I shouldn't lead you? Do you think that um when people relinquish some of that control, they also invite in fresh ideas and viewpoints and ideas? Oh, my goodness, for sure. So, I mean, it's, it is so – you learn so much because everyone looks at problems differently. They come at them from different angles. And yeah. so what you find is maybe you don't agree with everything, but, boy – you can hear, hey, I've got this idea for how to do this, or this is how we do it, and you'd be like, oh, my gosh. They just cut the amount of time in half to do something I was doing because they had different experience. They had different expertise. They looked at the problem differently than I did. So, for sure, you're, you're 100% correct there. Okay, that's great. And I'm glad that we had that conversation because I know a lot of small business owners who are very nervous about giving up any sort of control. And one of the things that they'll say is, um, well, they're not going to do it like I do. And my response is always, you're right, they're not. <laughs> but as long as they do it at least as well, you can't care. It's not about how it gets done. It's that it gets done, you know, as, as long as it's legal, ethical, and moral. For but, sure. You know, past that, you, right. you gotta, you, you got to be open to it. Different isn't always bad. It's just different. Yeah. Right, right. It can be great. Absolutely. Yeah, right. Okay, are there any, um, I'll say, unforeseen dangers of becoming an entrepreneur? I am sure that through your experience, you've talked to many entrepreneurs that have had unexpected consequences that, you know, that they didn't factor in. I think the one that hit me the most that I never would have considered is isolation. And so I found that I became so focused on what I was trying to accomplish that I sort of went into a little bubble. I would go into the office, I would do my job, I would go home. And it was like I looked up from my desk 10, 15 years later, and I was like, um, I don't know anyone. I, I've just been doing this. I don't, have a, I don't know anyone who's doing the same thing I'm doing. I don't know other people in the business world. I have spent almost no time getting out there and meeting other people. And so from that, I've taken this challenge, and I'd love to encourage every small business owner and entrepreneur to network. But I, I want to make a slight change to it. Um, and for lack of a better term, I, I call it networking with a twist. You can call it whatever you want. But I used to treat networking as a very inward-focused event. Hmm. It was, what can you do for me? You yeah. know someone, you have a piece of information, you have a skill, expertise. And I would argue that really what I was doing was I was just asking for a favor, which is totally fine. But networking – really, from my perspective, should become more of a way to create a connection. So I learned a lesson from my business mentor, and I try to use this in every single networking conversation I have. And I ask them this question, what can I do for you? The moment you ask someone that question, it changes the dynamic of the meeting. Now you're putting yourself in a position of service. You're creating a real connection and, and let's face it, not everyone is going to take you up on that. Right. But I, I've found a lot of people do. So I've had phone calls from people that I met with saying, hey, I know someone who's thinking about selling on Amazon. Would you talk to him? Absolutely. Had someone say, I know this guy who uh, is looking to develop his own private label business, and he doesn't understand how to get a hold of manufacturers. Would you talk to him? For sure. My wife is thinking about starting a business. She's just looking for someone to tell her some of the pitfalls that might, you know, things that she should look at. Would you talk to her? Absolutely. Yeah. And then the other thing that I do when it comes to networking that I would encourage people to do is stay in contact with them. Because if you really are networking to create a connection, I'm trying to create a real ongoing connection. They aren't always friendships, but they're very nice acquaintances. And so I update them every probably two months 
with what's new in my world, any new connections I've had. And I go as far as to set, and I'm not saying everyone needs to do this, but I've gone as far as to send out, I send out a networking tree. So I list all the people I've met, what they do, and I tell them what they did for me. So I have a little section that says what you've done for me, and I just jot down. Because every single conversation, someone's done something that really helps me. And then I have a column where it just says, how can I help you? And if they haven't asked for anything, then it's blank. But I do that because I want them to see, oh, other people are taking him up on this offer. It wasn't just an empty offer. Um, and so just encourage other people to come back and say, all right, I'd love to take you up on that. Here's what you could do to help me, and, I, and I'd be delighted to do it. I will tell you one other thing. I got this idea from one of your recent podcasts. So you had um, Ethan from BombBomb Bomb on talking about okay. rehumanize your business. And I haven't yeah. done it yet, but I want to try this. And I don't know if it's going to work, but I, was, I love the podcast. But I'm going to try to – he talked about how the use of videos increases human connection. Yeah. And I'm trying to create connections with my networking. So the next bi-monthly email that I send out, I'm going to have a video component of that and just see what Great. the response is. But I thought when he was talking about that, I was like, boy, that is awesome. I really love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a great um, – I mean, I, and, and I really appreciate what you said about networking. I agree with you. I think when people show up at a networking event with a mindset of, uh, you know, what can I get, mm-hmm. uh, they end up not even getting it. Because, Correct. Correct. right, they're just telegraphing that it's all about them. Mm-hmm. And they miss out on relationships that can be really invaluable to them in their life or their business because they're so laser focused on looking for particular things. Mm-hmm. So, you know, having that more expansive view of things, you just, you never have any idea who you're going to come across who's going to end up being a really great connection for you. So, for sure, and it's and, and I really say it's if you when you treat the networking as creating a connection versus yeah. a favor, it really yeah. changes the process. Yep, yep, I totally get that. Well, you'll have to let us know how it goes with your video. In, in oh your, yeah, I'm excited. I, I I I'm yeah. looking forward to doing it. Yeah, I'll bet. I'll bet it should be great. That's wonderful. Well, Wally, I really appreciate this conversation. Will you let the listeners know how they can find you, please? Absolutely. So probably the easiest way is go to my website, wallacegustafson.com, or you can type into Google Wally Gustafson. I'll come up. Um, You know, we've talked about a lot of the lessons that I've learned, or at least some of them. Back in 2013, I had published a book called You Are Not a Loser. Last month, I updated a second edition. And on my website, for free, you don't have to sign up for an email, nothing. For a limited time, you can download the e-version of that book. All of the lessons, over 30 lessons are documented in the book. And here's the best part. You don't even have to read the book. Skip all the way to chapters 31 and 32. You'll find them all recapped. So you'll be like, I don't, I don't want to read this guy's book because I'm not Jim Collins or Malcolm Gladwell, like that for sure. But you can skip all the way to the end and you can take a look at all the lessons I've learned and see, you know, learn from my mistakes. But it's free for your people, no signups, nothing. And then the last thing I want to do is say um, – to your audience, the same thing I would ask anyone that I network with. What can I do for you? So if there's anything, if you're listening and saying, boy, I have a question about something, there's a contact page on my website, send me an email. There's the link to my LinkedIn profile, connect with me that way. But if there's any way I can help anyone who's listening today, I would love to be able to reach out to them and respond and give them my thoughts or connections or whatever it might be. That's terrific. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Folks, take him up on it because I know he means it from previous um, conversations that I have had with him. So Absolutely. Please, please do. So, And thank you so much. And listeners, thank you. Uh, you are always who we are doing this for. And I would also like to thank our sponsor, Audible.com. To get your free trial of Audible.com as well as the free audio book, Go to audibletrial.com slash businessgrowth to sign up. As always, continue to prosper and be curious. And until we meet again on another episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, goodbye and good day. Me, 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 but also you. 
The Pharaoh fast-forwards his favorite foreign film. hip 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 powder donut <clears throat> Okay, what's my line? Uh, the only line I see here on the script is get options based on your budget with the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. Oh, man. That's a tongue twister, huh? I'm sorry. I'm going to need a few more minutes. <clears throat> bulbous Walrus. The Bulbous Walrus. The Name Your Price tool. Only from Progressive. The owl ran afoul of the comatose coxswain. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. Welcome to Don't Retire, Graduate. The podcast that asks you what you want to be when you grow up so you can graduate into retirement with a purpose and a passion, whether you're 25, 85, or any age in between. Gain actionable financial and mindset tips from your favorite authors, podcasters, and influencers to help you reach that exciting next chapter. Listen now and start building your path to financial freedom and reframing what retirement can mean to you. This is your host, Eric Brotman, reminding you, don't retire, graduate.